Hello. <laughs> Uh, so this is a story, unsurprisingly, about a map. This map, part of an ongoing collaboration with the Segorate Land Trust, an urban, indigenous, women-led land trust based here in the Bay Area. This map, titled by Karina Gould, Before You Are Here, is two and a half years in the making, thousands of hours by dozens of people. Most of us, we're pretty used to looking at maps. We see them every day on our phones. We see them on bus stops. We see them in our bookstores. A non-Indigenous Australian, it's me, born in Dakajung country, as a professor and a cartographer here at UC Berkeley, my job is pretty much maps. I was introduced to Segorate in 2021 through the Berkeley Center for New Media's Indigenous Technologies program. Segorate were interested in seeing whether or not a map could be made of the Bay Area which better represented from an Ohlone or specifically Segorate's perspective. Making a map of native land is never an easy task. We're used to seeing maps of the Bay that look particularly like this. But what is perhaps less familiar than this particular kind of map is that these, these maps enact particular worldviews which are deeply rooted in centuries of settler colonialism. Now, what do I mean by that? Really simply, these maps are the inheritors of the first maps made by Europeans of the Bay Area people who came here, who were not from here, when there were already people here, Ohlone people, and specifically here in the East Bay, the Chichenyo-speaking people of Huchin, whose land we are on. It's really difficult as well to colonize without using maps. Maps were used during the Spanish and the Mexican era, and by the US, to identify fertile land for agriculture, mineral deposits for mining, and to lay out plans for towns and even universities. But of course, every culture maps. The Rebelib charts of the Marshall Islanders use sticks and shells to show the currents and islands. The star compasses of the Carolinian navigators and their hand measurements help them follow the stars across the Pacific Ocean. Driftwood, hand-carved by Inuit people, helps them to trace the coastlines of Greenland in the dark by feeling the edges. And the songs of indigenous Australians help map enormous desert spaces. Songs that can be sort of tied together and traced for thousands of kilometers. Now, learning to read these maps, like all maps, requires decades of training and experience. But the difference between these maps and other or most non-Indigenous maps is that these maps are developed from the places that they map. And so they use systems and language that are deeply attuned to those particular environments. And so in approaching this map, the first question we ask Segorate is what are we mapping and why? We think maps are mostly about truth and accuracy, but the biggest challenge for cartographers is that the world is constantly shifting and changing, and we can't map everything in the world as it transforms, otherwise that map would just be the world. And so the way that cartographers deal with this is by freezing the world and then extracting selected information, such as rivers or roads, or in this case rocks, and presenting a particular version of that world. And so, we asked Segorate which version of the world did they want us to present. Segorate are Ohlone-led, but they're intertribal and multicultural, working to restore reciprocal relationships with the sacred land that we live on and the plants, animals and other human beings that we share the land with. Much of this work happens through rematriation, 
that is Indigenous women-led work that seeks to facilitate the return of land to native hands and stewardship. They have a growing collection of project sites, such as these two, where they work to restore native plants, grow food, and undertake cultural revitalization through language, environmental knowledge, and cultural practice. Cultural revitalization here is really important because without the right language, it's difficult to express what the world is. This is a problem for cartography in particular because native knowledges and languages often operate perpendicular to the way in which traditional cartography conceives of space and time. At the same time, Poetomi cartographer Margaret Wickens Pierce and Kanaka cartographer Renee Pulani Lewis argue that maps are really useful means for bringing together indigenous and non-indigenous knowledges, but specifically that our responsibility is to learn what must be kept and what must be let go for one map moment in a time. Most of the records, most of the historical records of the Bay Area come from settler documents such as surveys, maps, journals, mission letters, etc. But the way in which missionaries and explorers and governments saw the Bay Area was very different to the memories handed down generation after generation, the stories, the lived experiences and embodied knowledges that were described to us in our conversations with Sigorite. It was clear that Sigorite wanted us to make a map that not just that built a world, rather than just reflected it. They wanted a map that could bring together what we knew and what we did not yet know, what is certain and uncertain, what is visible and invisible. And so rather than a kind of cartographic project, we began to approach before you're here as more of a cosmography, a way of worlding. And in doing so, in relinquishing cartography, we were able to craft a different kind of map that questions not just what we know, but how we know. And of course, the next question is not just what we are making a map of and why, but how should we go about making that map? For cartographers, it's mostly about questions of projection and orientation. Now, if you've ever looked at a map like this and wondered why Antarctica is so stretched out, or why Europe and North America is at the top, that's a question of projection. Projection determines how the map is arranged and from where we measure. Most mapping software uses uh, coordinate systems that measure from the point at which the equator intersects with the prime meridian, which runs through the Royal Naval Observatory in Greenwich in the UK. Now, Sigurate were not too thrilled about having their worldview measured from the heartland of the British Empire, fair, and asked us to instead measure from Le Shawn, the first rematriated site down near San Leandro Creek in Oakland. But when we asked them, yeah, so what should be on the top? They answered our question with another question. Why did there have to be a top at all? Now, there are some maps that don't have tops, mostly of the polar regions, but trying to make a map of the Bay Area without a top pretty much broke all the card except graphic software that we owned. And so we returned literally to the drawing board and spent months, starting with the Shauna 00, stretching, warping, reorienting, deorienting, reprojecting the shoreline of the bay into a map that looked like this. Strange kind of planet. The next question was perspective. From where should we look? And again, they turned it back on us. Why must we only look from one place? Again, cartographic software broke. And so we spent more months going through historical surveys and sketches of the hills around the bay to be able to craft a map that was able to combine the top-down view of the shoreline with a bird's eye perspective of the hills so you can look down and across from all angles from Le Shawn. And then we combine that with a third perspective, up. So Gorate were adamant that we had to include the importance of seasons to a lone life. The seasons depicted through the stars embody not just the circularity of seasons, but also the way in which Janella LaRose describes them as 
bearing witness to the ongoingness of settler colonialism. And so we map the seasons, or the stars rather, as if you're standing from Le Chorne, looking at every angle, for the year 1578, the year before Francis Drake arrived up in Coast Miwok territory, the year before the Bay Area began to appear on European maps. It runs anti-clockwise, starting with the winter solstice over Tushtuk or Mount Diablo, before going onto the fall equinox, the summer solstice, and the spring equinox. Of course, the bay also bears witness. These contours depict the original shape of the bay floor before gold mining up in the Sierras spent 350 million cubic meters worth of sediment into the bay. And the creeks were restored to their original pathways before they were redirected and culverted to make way for urban development. Finally, 425 shell mounds were mapped, shell mounds that dot the Bay Area, some still extant and some not. But we didn't want to freeze space either like cartography does, and instead we sought to collapse it, compressing it. Corinna Gould always reminds us that the Ohlone are a living people who are robustly and intentionally present, who drive Priuses and have iPhones. Furthermore, colonization and rematriation are ongoing, and so we did this in a bunch of tiny little ways, but perhaps the most obvious are the icons. The Chinook salmon left, and we've depicted their recent return, waiting in the bay for the right temperature to continue their journey upstream. Mussel shells continue to reassert the, the existence of Ohlone people under the face of massive urban redevelopment, like that down at Bay Street, where the Emeryville shell mound once stood. The monarch butterflies have returned to Gill Trap up in Albany. Oysters a testament to the impact that industrialization and pollution have had on Ohlone foodways, Tuli continues to be woven by Ohlone people into baskets and boats, and the acorns of the coast live oak continue to nourish local communities. But perhaps the most difficult thing about this map has been names or toponymy. Place names are some of the most intimate expressions of land and indigeneity. They're also sometimes the first things to be co-opted captured or erased by settler colonialism. And so the struggle was twofold. One, how do we do with the vast array of names in different Ohlone languages, including Chichenyo, um, which Silgarete mostly works? And secondly, the really basic issue. The most fonts don't have the necessary glyphs, like this T minuscule, to be able to express indigenous languages. And so for this map, the names around the outside were written by Deja Gould, who is the Chichenyo language holder for her tribe, the Confederated Villages of Lashawn, and also a member of the Sugorite Land Trust. And the font before you are here was created by Diné topographer Noah Lee. Finally, all around the outside are the names of all the people who've worked with this project. But I know you can't see them. So I'll take this moment to thank everybody who has been involved, particularly the folks at Sugorite, Corinna, Deja, Daniela, Ines, and Viola. Before I end, I have a small confession. This wasn't really a story about a map, even though it was a story about a map. It was really a story about what it means to represent worlds, our worlds and the worlds of others, and the consequences of the design choices and tools we make and use. It's also a story about Sigora Tay, about cultivation and rematriation, and about their vision of a Bay Area in which Ohlone language and ceremony are an active and thriving part of the cultural landscape, about their vision where Ohlone place names and history are both known and recognized, and where intertribal indigenous communities have access to affordable housing, social services, cultural centers, and land on which to live and work. Before you are here is only one small part of that, but it's the first of many maps that we hope to make which might help bring together different worldviews and might help us more deeply comprehend the complexity of both the past and present, and maybe, if we get lucky, try to imagine a different kind of future. Thank you.